I don't know what's your picture of uh, paradise. When I say paradise, what kind of pictures comes to your mind? Um, if you Google it, and I suppose if I could Google some of your brains, some of the pictures uh, that would occur to, your, uh, to you would be, for instance, long, lonely beaches, hammock, um, blue water, green water, peace, calm, pretty much the Maldive islands, actually. I, am I into something, or how is that? Yeah? As I said, that's the answer Google gives to it, if you uh, Google image it. Uh, but what about the original paradise, um, the one that is uh, described in Genesis? I don't know what picture that comes to your mind when I say that kind of paradise. Um, it might be that it's similar, maybe it's the same thing. Maybe you think that looked like the Maldive Islands, you never know. Um, but we're going to dive a bit into the paradise this afternoon. Um, and we're going to take a look at the beginning, how it all started. And that's fair enough when it, this is the beginning of Connect. Um, and the first thing we're going to look at today, that is the intention behind our life, behind the life of man in paradise. When God created man, this was a decision. He made it completely of his own will. And we don't have any other answer to why God created man. He wanted to create, and he did it. He formed Adam from the soil of the earth, and he breathed his ruach, as it is in Hebrew, his breath into Adam. It was the spirit of life. Man is wanted by God, not needed. You know that, I suppose, but it wasn't like God was sitting up in heaven and feeling lonely or bored or something and came up with an idea about, oh, maybe I should create someone that could fill in the holes for me. No, he created us, the almighty, sovereign, creator God. He who himself is life. And he gives life to the creation and brings life into creation. We can apply it immediately, actually, uh, by saying, putting it like this. You and I, we can't master the art of living we can only master the art of receiving life. The life that God gives. And that means that life in itself, from the very beginning, from the first pages in the Bible, the life is an act of grace. And in the book of Job, in chapter 34, we read in the verses 14 to 15, I don't know if many of you brought your Bibles or how that, that is, but maybe I can give some time for you to, to find it if you like. Job 34, verses 14 to 15. It says, If he should set his heart to it and God gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. Which means the life of human beings are deeply rooted in the very life of God. In this is our value, our worth and our purpose. It is to joyfully receive daily life from God, use it for good and thank him for it. And that should create a sense of awe and gratitude as we face each other as well. And the life we all have received. Take a look around. 
some of you might know each other, others don't. But take a look around and imagine this person, this person, that person, that person. All persons are willed by God. The human beings were created in the image of God. And I think that God in us, have, he has some purposes for our lives, each and one of us. And I think we could probably identify a dozen of them, but I, I want for us now to just kind of contemplate three of them. Three of the reasons, the intention that God had when he created Adam and Eve. He created Adam and Eve in relationship to himself. That is our first uh, strongest bond in life. He created us in his image, in his likening. And that very word for, for in, in the image of. Um, different people are kind of disagreeing on what that means, but the Hebrew word kind of gives us an impression of that the image of God is like, it's like a, a, an imprint, like, I don't know if you've done this uh, when you were a child or you have already done it with your child, but, but if your father or something, or even your mother, uh, kind of s cemented a st outdoor stairway or something, you could, I, I did this, I, 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 can, I m was allowed to put my hand down into the concrete and leave an imprint of my hand, and there it was, and it still is, forever after. That is the very word. The thought of God making hi us in his image is that he's put a mark on us, like the palm of his hand is upon us. And the thought, though, was that the hand of God always should fill the mark that it had laid upon us. Open, free, non-restricted fellowship with God. We understand that special relationship between God and man when we read about how God is talking to them, articulating his thinking to them, walking with them in the breeze of the evening sun in the Garden of Eden. There was no limits to the access to God, the life himself. He was with them and they were with him and he provided a garden for them to sustain them and provide an arena for human flourishing. So that's the first intention God had to make us, to make us know him and be known by him, being with each other. The second intention if Adam's first awakening was important, but it was, God breathed into him. I don't know if it was a short breath or a long breath or like a or a But the first time Adam kind of opened his eyes, he's, look, he's looking right into the face of God. If that awakening was important, the second awakening of Adam was almost of equal importance. Um... To have a clear sense of belonging in God's loving gaze is to be all fulfilling for us, that's for sure. But God saw something in his sinless, flawless, uh, deathless garden that was not good. He's been creating everything and saying, oh, this is good. And day two, this is good. And day three, this is good. But there is something before the fall that is not good. And that is for the man to be alone. So he makes Adam sleep and out of his side he makes the woman and we know she's called the woman because when Adam woke up he said, whoa, man. <laughs> I know that's kind of a bad joke. Uh, but, but, but he is looking straight into the face of another yet strangely familiar to him. We were built for fellowship with each other. You and I, in some way or another, are meant to be. 
We are meant to be together. And Adam and Eve were literally made for each other. They lived together in complete understanding, without any need for hiding from each other. The fact that they were naked is not mentioned even, not after the fall. It's no, it's no need to do it. There's no need to point it out. Um, their openness towards, towards each other were total. There was no rivalry, no jealousy, no positioning, no threat, indifference between them. It's just, it's good. It's good. The third point might, might come as a surprise for some of us. When we picture paradise, we picture the hammock, which Hildegun spoke about. But we were put in the garden to do good works. We wasn't meant to just, just hang around doing nothing. And to me, it's, it's kind of amazing because the first experience of man, God was creating, he was working, day one, day two, day three, and then day six, he created man. And the first living day of man, what experience do they have? I imagine they're going to God and, what, what are we going to do today, God? What we, we're ready, we're ready. I haven't, we haven't done anything in our whole lives because it's been so short. But um, what are we going to do today? And then God say, today we rest. Our first experience is from rest. And that, I think, is a pattern of life. We are to work from rest, not rest from work. Life in paradise was meant to be a life of work, of good work. It's not hard work, it's not sweating, but a God-ordained call to multiply and to be fruitful and to do stuff, do stuff with the garden. Do you see this wood and these trees and this, this soil? Make something, make, make bricks. <laughs> be creative. Because I am the creator God and you are in my image so you can be my co-creators doing good work. And work was never about earning money or making a living first and foremost. It was about human flourishing, helping each other to blossom. So there we are, you and I, Adam and Eve, in our purest human form, deeply rooted in the life of God, connecting to him and unashamedly connecting to each other in the midst of the Garden of Eden. And God looked at it and he said, oh, this is very, very good. And he blessed us and he gave us gifts to enjoy. There was only one thing he asked us not to do. Do you see all these trees I have given you? Do you see them? Hundreds of them, maybe thousands. There is only one I don't want you to eat from. Only because, only because I said so. Only because I love you and I want to know if you love me as well and will be obedient in this. But all the rest, Every three, tree is for you to enjoy. It's very strange that the snake su succeeded in this harmony. It's difficult to understand for us. But what he did was that he challenged the man and the woman on their loyalty to God and how to respect and submit to his good will for them. And then paradise lived, turned to paradise lost. They didn't know how big the loss was going to be, but it was the total loss of paradise with the roots of life buried deep in the perfect soil of God and into a reality with loose roots, broken relationships and chaos. Imagine me taking one of our boys to the toy store and I point at one of the shelves and say, do you like that toy? Yeah, yeah, probably. If it's something cool. Moms don't know cool thing, but you know. 
and I could ask, what about that one? Do you like that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and another one, this one? Yay! And he would probably be on his toes with big eyes. And what about me then saying, you're never going to get any of it. And I'll dedicate the rest of my life to make sure that happens. <laughs> that would be good. But listen, isn't that what the snake is doing in the garden? Do you see that tree? Do you like it? Do you like it a lot? Do you know why God doesn't want you to eat from it? It's because it's the best one. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? That lie was planted in the human heart. It was the lie that because God didn't let you have everything, he really don't want you to have anything. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So with the feeling of being cheated and wronged and with burning pride in the heart, the woman and the man were stretching their hands in mistrust to the loving God. They took life into their own hands and they did not have the skills and the power to handle it. And at that very moment, their life-sustaining roots in God were lost. A series of ironies occurred. We thought we could become God, but discovered our nudity. We thought we got freedom, but harvested imprisonment. We aspired for glory, but received shame. We thought we got security, but we lost our identity. It's nice if somebody can pray for the guitar. I think, I hope. It looks okay. Great. Um, sin is actually not a word designed by Christians to beat people, other people, down uh, and bring them to kind of to a low state of mind. It is actually just a word that accounts for a very clear human experience shared by all human beings. You and I, we are not living in an, in an ideal world. We step over each other's boundaries. We think of ourselves a lot, all the time. We do not always do good and often actually do bad. Why? Why all this? Because of sin. The consequence of Adam and Eve's rebellion is not only that paradise was lost for them, but the whole humanity ever after was infected by this lethal disease that made us all completely unable not to commit sin. We might probably discipline ourselves, take some karate judo trick on our own heart, restraining it so we don't kill and cheat and lie. But the bottom of our inner person, there lies the roots of evil that make us avoid God, trying to hide ourselves from each other and our desire to act as God ourselves. I think when I've been listening to people talking about sin, I think it's important to make a distinction between sins and the sin. There is, there is namely a sin beneath the sin. There's always a sin under the sins of the everyday life. We often tend to think when we hear the word sin, think of lying and stealing and killing and I don't know, poking. Uh, each other's face. Um, all the things the Ten Commandments don't uh, tell us not to do. Not the one about poking, though. Um, and we know these are bad things. Maybe it's even easy avoidable. Um, 
we should try to resist them. But all these things are only symptoms. They're only surface symptoms of an inner problem, an inner disease, namely the complete rebellion against our Creator God. We have control issues with Him. We have psychological issues with Him. We have practical issues with Him. The sin underneath the the sin is putting our own self on the throne and casting God down. Like we, for instance, do when we won't have God have anything to say about my use of my money. It is, after all, my money. I earned it. Stay away, God. The sin underneath the sin is relying on our own self for life and identity and worth and significance and not relying on God for those things. So we restless consume books on mindfulness and self-coaching and positive psychology, desperately trying to reclaim the lost shalom, the lost peace of Eden, resisting that we have a given identity as human beings and that the hand of God upon us was supposed to be enough. The sin underneath the sin is to rely on own effort, own track record, own competency, rather than God's work for us. In some, it is substituting the creator for the creation. It's dethronalizing God and elevating the things that God has made. Either we turn our back towards the creator completely, or we try to use the creator to master or get the created things that we really worship, that we really are after. Paul in Romans says it very clearly, Romans chapter 1 verses 21 and 22 and 23. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Augustine lived long ago. He puts it brilliantly when he calls sin. Do you know what sin is? Sin is disordered love. It is love out of order. So I could shoot a man to get his, which we saw by the way, to, to, to get his big bowl of money. Not because of my hatred towards the man, but because of the love of money over the love of man. My list doesn't, it, it's, it's wrong, it's disordered. In other words, the essence of sin is idolatry. You know, it would be great if I found my the correct page. Yeah, yeah. This rebellion, this idolatry that Degard has described, um, had a lot of consequences, and all these consequences was this paradise lost thing. As we said, there were three main intentions behind creating man. And when sin came into the world, these three things changed. Let's begin with the last Vega mention, namely work. Work became a pain. Some of you might recognize that in the mon- Monday mornings, for instance. Um, instead of being a creative and giving process, Work became 
sweaty and it became hard. It became something we do just because we have to. That was not God's intention. That doesn't mean that we still can't find uh, joy in our work. Some of us are very lucky and we work with things we find fun. And that's, that's a good thing. And I think that's because some of the imprint of God still lies at the bottom of us, but it has been destroyed by sin. We were created to work and to work with God. Our bodies, our minds are designed for it, but sin destroyed it. The second thing is that we lost the fellowship with each other. From living in an open and free relationship, Adam and Eve were immediately ashamed when they saw each other as naked. They tried to cover and they started to use blame as a weapon between them. Sin made them hide. And the person that is hiding herself or himself is effectively, uh, effectively blocking the way for true intimacy. When looking around today, it's a strong irony that there's a culture for showing a lot of intimacy, intimate sides of ourselves, posted here and there, shown on TV. And at the same time, more and more people tell about loneliness, the feeling of not being understood, the feeling of not having any worth. People post pictures of themselves in sexy positions with little clothes on. And at the same time, at least in Norway, we hear that um, after the gym lessons in schools, people don't want to take show a shower because they're too embarrassed of their bodies. The need to hide and cover is an effect of the nature of the original sin against God. We understood that trying to become like God was wrong, but there was no way humans could redo it. Then there was only one way out, and that was to try to hide. Something that is rather optimistic, actually, when dealing with an almighty God. And the most profound thing, the most severe, the most critical thing was that we lost the fellowship with God. It was the ultimate point of no return in history. God saw what man had done. And the justice of God was challenged by this rebellion. We earned the punishment. And I mean, what respect would remain for a God that didn't react to the sin? Should he just say, oh, that's a pity that you sinned, but let's not bother. Let's pretend I didn't say that. Let's just continue and feel good. Let's pretend nothing happened. Move on as we were. Imagine being Adam and Eve and, and you've done all this and you discovered your nakedness and you were hiding and then all of a sudden you hear Adam, <laughs> where are you? Because it's like God is coming down at the grand zero, just la crash landing into the human chaos, what the humans have done. And he's not like, what have you done? He is offended. His holy wrath has kind of up on this, but he asks us three questions. Adam, where are you? God is looking for you. He's coming, he's pursuing you. Have you eaten from the tree? Own up, Adam, be honest. And who has told you that you were naked? And I think that that is three good questions for us to start pondering on during this weekend. Where are you? Where are you in your life? Where are you in your relationship to God? What have you done? Do you own the things of your life? 
Do you blame others? And are you ashamed? Have you discovered your nudity? Are you kind of a masquerade person who covers up a lot of yourself? If it hadn't been for sin, our Bible would be very, very short. You know that. The two first chapters of Genesis and the two last chapters of the Revelation that make us kind of, I don't know, it invites us to kind of own the fact that there is mess in my life and that there is mess in your life and that without God doing something with us, we are utterly, utterly lost. But there are some hopeful things at the end of this story in the Garden of Eden. And we're going to look more into the, those things when we come. Just let us pray now. Heavenly Father, first of all, I want to thank you for creating us. Thank you for creating us, wanting us. My life, any life in this room is not an accident. It was wanted by you. You have a plan for us. And at the same time, we have to acknowledge before a holy God that, that my life is not according to your standards. I fall short. I fall short of your standards. I fall short of your glory. Towards you alone have I sinned, have we sinned. And we want, us, we want you to show us two th truths this weekend. Show us, Lord, that we are more lost than we can ev ever dare to own up to. In ourselves, we are truly, truly lost and damned. But on the other hand, show us that as well, God, that we are more loved than we can ever dare to hope for. That we are loved by you and that you call us into repentance and faith. Show us, Lord.